Okay, uh, so in, uh, in preparation for this talk, I was actually doing a little bit of research about, uh, about Kiefer's history, a little bit about the timeline, and um, I actually got a little sidetracked. I ended up stumbling upon a, a little bit of history about virtualization in general, and I kind of thought this was interesting, so I figured I'd share it. Um, virtualization, its concept has been around a long time, and what I was reading is that virtualization in some form has been around since around the 1960s. I'll take the internet's word for it. So it's been around a long time um, as a concept. And when you think about the idea of virtualization as, as a technology and, and, and you put QVert on the timeline of different use cases and ways to use virtual, virtual machines, it's kind of interesting to think about. QVert is a uh, concept of running virtual machines on top of a cloud native environment, running virtual machines on top of Kubernetes. Um, so actually running that virtual machine inside a pod so a really interesting concept when you, when you think about it that way. And so kind of going back to um, QVert and when, when the, um, you know, the project started, it was around 2016, uh, began as a concept and eventually became a project. And uh, over the last seven years or so, this, this project has spent a lot of time uh, and over this long journey to uh, eventually reach V1. Uh, which is a really exciting milestone and accomplishment by the community. And, and so that's what we're gonna talk about today, some of what that means for you as an end user, what that means for you as someone in the community, what that means for you as a developer, uh, when we say V1 uh, as something that has been released. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about what's next. Um, you know, now that V1's released, what can you expect to, to see uh, next from Qvert? So when we were, coming up with this V1 release and cutting the, the V1 release, we wanted to come up with a theme. What were we gonna focus on when we released Qvert? And the theme we came up, came up with was we wanted to align with Kubernetes. So what does that mean, uh, aligning with Kubernetes? Well, it means a lot of different things. Um, and one of the things that uh, we, we first focused on was uh, the release cadence. Qvert as a project has been releasing on a monthly cadence for almost six years. And this made a lot of sense for a long period of time. If you can imagine, Qvert's got a lot of, a lot of features it needs to develop. So there's a lot of maintenance, there's a lot of uh, feature velocity that's going to the project. A lot of these features we need to get out to end users, we need to get the hands of developers. And so there's monthly releases with these features. So this went on for a long period of time, but in the last year or so, leading up to, to V1, the community was really focused on trying to stabilize these APIs. And so slowing the, the feature velocity a little bit. And, and so the, what we came to was, okay, well, Kubernetes has releases three times a year. So we can look to align in, in that sense that we can reduce the amount of uh, releases we have. And this is really nice uh, for a lot, of, a lot of reasons for stability. I know as an end user of NVIDIA, like we really appreciated this, this is, um, we can't really keep up with monthly releases from Qvert. We'd rather have it consume this like maybe once or twice a year and, and, and larger chunks instead of having to constantly upgrade and end up getting behind. Um, so th this was really nice and, and a really nice uh, change for end users. And, um, and even Kubernetes, if you think about it, went through this. Um, even in the beginning, when Kubernetes started in 2014, the release cadence was a lot faster. And then eventually, even only as, as recent as like three, four years ago, it was four times a year, and now it's changed three times a year. So similar progression that Qvert has gone through. And, and so now the important thing is that there'll be three releases a year and, and they're gonna be aligned with Kubernetes. So Kubernetes will release, and then there'll be a, a, a period of time, about eight weeks, that Qvert will spend to then do stabilization and then eventually release, uh, a, a cut a Qvert release. Um, and so kind of in the same vein of like, of aligning with Kubernetes, the other thing we, we wanted to do is, is is in, in create more SIGs. Qvert for a while had um, some SIGs, uh, but we wanted to expand this concept and for a lot of various reasons, like specialization, you know, get some more ownership in different areas of the code base. And so um, we looked to explore that concept um, as, a, as another concept to mature the project. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about, about these. And, and so starting with uh, SIG scale, um, this is a, um, an important uh, concept, obviously, and 
in the world of, of virtualization and, and computing. We, we need to be able to scale. We need to be performant. And um, so this, this SIG, its, its charter was to focus on um, how can QVirt be scale, how can it scale, it can be performant and provide guidance and across the project, influence pull requests and, and to try and make things more performant and make it more scalable. And the, um, the really critical point is that in order to do this, we have to measure. It's really important. We measure and we measure over time. And um, so what we do is we, as in six scales, we, we measure across releases. So you think about it as we'll have like a V1 release. You know, we've looked at, we look at all the pull requests and we have a fixed set of PRs and we run a, uh, our fixed set of, of data um, of configurations and we run um, a job that tests uh, performance. And uh, we measure that consistently over time and, and we get ourselves a trend line. And then we look at our trend line and we, we compare that over time and, and we can get a sense of, okay, how well are we performing um, given these changes? And, and so ultimately what we, we get is, as output is this really nice um, way to communicate to end users that, okay, here's what you can expect from Qvert on this release. Will there be a performance change that could affect you in, in some way, and you can be aware of that stuff. And, and, and so the, you know, good example, like we measured um, virtual machine overhead um, across releases, like whenever we, if there was an increase, we, we catch these things and we, we document them in release notes, we, um, we mention them. So it's, it's really clear, like what, what can happen to the, end, you know, if you're gonna consume this release. And so all these things are really a sign of a, of a mature project and, and that's, um, you know, that's been our focus for 1.0. And what's even interesting here, if you look at the diagram, um, you can see there's some dotted lines. Um, there's two pairs of dotted lines. There's uh, the one on the left, one on the right. And the, the dotted gray line is um, a, when the Qvert release started. And then the dotted blue line and that's left, far left pair, which is actually the, the Kubernetes release. We, we moved to a different Kubernetes release for our testing. And so you can kind of see how like how this things could could change. Um, even on the far left of the diagram, we, when we started measuring, you can see that there was some pull requests that, that caused some changes. And then what's interesting, even if you go to the far right side of the diagram with the red dotted line, that's Kubernetes 127. And you can see there's a clear correlation here, like that something has changed that our, our data sets, our, our data points have become, have, have tight groupings, whereas before they're a little bit uh, more sparse. And so you can see that something changed. And we can clearly correlate that with, with Kubernetes 127. So it's interesting. We see this stuff happen and when we measure it um, over time. And in this case, it was actually a nice performance improvement that we observed. Uh, six scale, so this is the other half, or excuse me, scalability. This is the other half of six scale, so measuring scalability across releases. Um, what's, what's cool here is, um, well, the way we measure is we look at um, scalability as the number of HTTP requests we make to the API server, right? API server is just a resource. It's shared by all different APIs. And the um, Qvert is just another user that consumes those API resources. And so we want to be as good of a citizen as we possibly can. And so really cutting down on the number of requests that we have to make. But you can actually see here in this diagram that, that there's an increase. We, we have on the far left, we go from um, so this job is, is creating 100 virtual machines, and um, we can see there's a pretty strong correlation. About 100 virtual machines yields about one-to-one -one for the number of patches that have to be made to the API server. But we can see that jumped about over, to about 200, and this had to do with the pull request that we had to um, incorporate. And so we had to make some trade-offs and in, to actually bringing this in. And you know, this was an important pull request, so we decided that okay, we need to have this. But what's important for, your, for you as an end user is like you can see that there's a, you can see the trend line, you can see that, okay, here's what's changing, here's why it changed, and here's what you can expect. And, and here's the same thing on, you can see on the, the far right, with the, to the right of the, the red dotted line, you get Kubernetes 127, and then our data set changed again. Now we've got sparse data, sparse data points when we, when we do our patches. So this is kind of cool because this is something that we observed from Kubernetes 127. Something we don't really have an explanation for this, but this is one that we want to take with the talk with the Kubernetes six scale group to get a, an explanation on because it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, and then SIG API. Uh, this is a fairly new API. This is, or excuse me, a fairly new SIG. This is um, 
the plan for this uh, this SIG is to review the API evolution of Qvert. So do you think about it, like as new changes come in, as the API changes, um, new features come in, we want to make sure there's backwards compatibility. This, we're not going to be interrupting end users. You can continue to use this these stable APIs and you're not going to experience any, any major issues that would break you. Yeah, uh, for, uh, oops. It's very sensitive. <laughs> so for six scale, uh, sorry, for six uh, compute, um, it's a, it's a, uh, basically the basic responsibility of compute is gonna take care of all the compute features and traditionally the, uh, like the core features of, <clears throat> of Qbert. So when we reach the V1, um, and yesterday we had a release of uh, uh, 1.1, um, we already had a lot of features, um, we can, and what's common between all of these features, well, these are like mature, mature features of uh, um, <clears throat> like a virtualization. And some of these features were on our backlog uh, for a very long time, and we, uh, we tried to get to it, but um, I mean, uh, um, a lot of things uh, stopped us from, uh, from implementing those. And um, um, uh, some of these uh, features, they are right now breaching the gap between um, 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 traditional virtualization uh, data, um, 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 yeah, traditional virtualization, data center virtualization um, that are now available on Kubert. And um, um, some other stopgaps uh, for us were the, uh, um, the Kubernetes supports for, the, uh, uh, for all of these features. Uh, we never wanted to implement uh, features that are only dedicated uh, for Kubert, like Kubert specific, and we wanted to leverage as much as, as possible the, uh, um, the Kubernetes and Kubernetes uh, um, uh, flows and and, uh, and principles. So if we'll, for example, focus on uh, on CPU and memory hot plug uh, that was introduced. Uh, um, for a long time, uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, had this uh, uh, philosophy that uh, pods are immutable and uh, um, it, it, there's no way to um, to change the, the specification of the pod. And now, uh, recently, as uh, Kubernetes grew, um, uh, there was a way forward uh, with the uh, um, a vertical pod scaling feature that uh, allows uh, uh, pods to be immutable and uh, allows uh, pods uh, uh, to change the spec. And uh, um, we came to, to implement uh, the CPU and memory in a, in a Qbert specific way, but now we have a way forward to, uh, to move it to a more uh, cloud native solution. So there will be um, a native implementation for this. Um, yeah, going forward, the networking uh, SIG um, is responsible, obviously, for, for networking. Uh, they had uh, a lot of interesting features. I won't list all of them, but I mean, the, uh, the notable ones are the uh, um, network uh, uh, hot plug API that you could uh, add more NICs to, to a virtual machine. And then uh, recently, again, as a sign as a matur of maturity, the, um, um, the networking team implemented um, um, a pluggable binding um, um, a component. When we just started Qbert, uh, we had uh, several binding um, bindings of like um, a bridge binding and uh, a masquerade binding. And as we as we grew, uh, the the number of these bindings kind of exploded, and the, um, every other user wanted to implement uh, a different binding uh, for its own solution. So the um, the change uh, the recent change is that uh, the networking team created a pluggable uh, uh, binding and exported all the uh, most of the bindings to uh, to an external repo that kind of provides a reference architecture uh, for anyone to develop their own uh, plugin and use it with virtual machines. And then um, the storage uh, uh, had a lot of interesting uh, interesting features. Um, won't go over them, but. Um, and one notable uh, example here is, um, is again, is the data volumes. And how, uh, at the beginning, when we just started Qbert, um, um, there was no solution, uh, there was no seamless solution for managing images and how, uh, how would you upload these images into volumes and uh, um, these volumes need to be pre-populated before you start the, uh, the virtual machine. 
So Kubernetes didn't have such a solution. We had to develop it uh, ourselves. But this inspired um, um, uh, Kubernetes to design a new uh, volume populators that are useful for us and uh, provide a solution for, uh, for, other, um, uh, for, for others in the ecosystem. And, uh, and now we have a way forward to kind of deprecate um, the data volumes and use the cloud native solution that uh, Kubernetes provides uh, with the volume populators. Again, kind of a sign of uh, maturity of the, of the project. So what's next? Um, what's, what's next for Kuber? What's in uh, the future? And uh, the focus is, um, besides some features, which I'll, t I'll mention, um, is really focused on graduation. Um, Qvert joined the CNCF sandbox in, in 2022. And um, since then, a lot has changed. As, as we've alluded to, there's been a lot more features. Um, the V11 was just released recently with even more features. Um, there's a blog out from the CNCF that actually goes through and, and talks about um, some of the features that are in there. Uh, there's more stability um, and uh, a lot of exciting things for, for end users. And so, so our focus, or one of our main focuses, we want to we reach graduation. And what we're doing in the community is we're, we're currently gathering the requirements and, and putting together proposals for, uh, for doing this. Uh, but what's really important is actually, um, you know, from, from you guys, from everyone in the room, um, getting in adopters. Like, the, there are a lot of adop adopters out there. Like, we hear about them all the time. People come up to us and they say, like, oh, yeah, we use Qvert. We like Qvert. But we don't always see is the, the, the public endorsement of it. And, and Qvert has a way to do this. There's, a, there's just an adopters file. It's just a markdown file that the, the community shares. And um, people that use Qvert, um, you know, we encourage you as an end user to, you know, to list yourself as an adopter. And um, really, all it means is it, it just helps the project. It helps the, you know, the visibility of the project. It, you know, it shows that, you know, a lot of, a lot more, a lot of people are using it. And um, you know, we always hear, like we say, like I said, we, we hear about it all the time, but we, we don't always see like some people wanting to add themselves as an adopter. And, and so, if you do want to do that, um, you know, please reach out to Andrew or Fabian, and, and they can help you with that um, and adding yourself and mentioning yourself as an adopter of Qvert. And, and that will help with graduation. I mean, one of the things like uh, one of the requirements of graduation is having a lot of end users. And, and, and so, you know, public endorsement is these are the kinds of things that help get the project to graduation. Uh, so what else? Um, we look at uh, ex expanding SIGs. Like I mentioned, this important topic of um, you know SIGs and ownership, and one of the areas that we've seen a lot of success in is is getting these specializations together, getting these groups of, of, of people together that that care about a specific topic and really defining ownership for the group. So um, the project really wants to expand on that concept, um, try and find some additional SIG groups and. Um, you know, continue to, to drive that home in the community. Um, and then features, um, like what are the features that like we consider to be really important um, for actually going through and taking the next step in graduation? Um, well, security, security is a huge one, right? We want, we want the, the project to be secure. Um, and one of the big features that was delivered recently was um, non-root by default. Um, so the, uh, now in all the testing lanes in Qvert, um, we're, we're running as we're running as non-root, and so that's really exciting, um, and something really important for for reaching graduation. Um, hot plug's another one, and um, you know, Vladik mentioned CPU memory hot plug, and to re reiterate on this one, it's it's just a sign of maturity. It's the, as the project um, to be able to reach this this level as a as a virtual virtualization platform is is important. So. You know, showing that we can do some a feature like this, especially in this environment, in a cloud native environment, is is really cool to see, and and that's um, that's also something that that currently exists. Um, so, what about things that we want to do um, before kind of going to graduation? Uh, multi architecture support, um, and I have their full support um, because right now you can actually run on ARM, uh, but it's considered experimental, and really all that means is that. The Qvert community has a bunch of test lanes for x86, and those tests run on every PR, every pull request. And for um, for ARM, there's been a lot of work that's been ongoing to actually create parity 
between not only FutureWise, but also in the test lanes. And so that's what's really important. We want to make sure that ARM, all, of, all the features that we have for x86 are also tested in ARM for every pull request. Um, and that's kind of what, one of the important criteria before being fully graduated and supported. So we want to eventually get there. Um, I would say it's feature parity wise, it's very close, like 90, 95% so that we've observed. And then we kind of want to you know, finish out that, those, that last bit of um, feature testing to, uh, before we say it's fully supported. Uh, and then finally, performance. Um, you know, I alluded to like some of the measurements we do and the, you know, our trends lines that we observe. You know, those are the kinds of things that we're going to continue to observe and continue to observe across future Qvert releases and publish about. Um, uh, specifically, um, you know, I, I, we want to do a few things. Like we, we want to improve on our reporting. And right now we kind of, we, we report whenever we come across things that are, that could affect performance positively, negatively. And we want to improve that. We, we, the invisibility of these things in the release notes, like performance is, are things that we really want to be clear to the end user. You, know, you want to open the release notes and you want to know exactly like what what's what's coming when I adopt this release, and you know specifically performance is a good example of one of those things that you hear a lot about that people want to see called out, and even even more specifically like when we look at feature wise, um, reducing the the VM memory footprint is a big one. Um, we've had a lot of focus on on this and recently in different ways, um, but we really want to try and reduce the VM memory footprint, um, the actual vert launcher process the that actually manages the guest inside the pod. We want to have that. Um, we want to try and, if we can, in any way, reduce that memory footprint just so that we can be more lean. So as you get to larger scales, you try to get as many VMs crammed onto a host as possible. We can, um, we can make sure that we, you know, there's not a whole lot of overhead. This is only going to help our scale even more. Okay, and um, that's all we had. So thank you very much for attending, and we like to take questions if anyone's got any. So if you want, you can shout them out, or there's a microphone right here. Thank you. Great, great talk. Um, I have a question. What happens, you know, what do you think about uh, reconciling the idea of having VMs, you know, sometimes big VMs over Kubernetes? Philosophy, microservices, big VMs. How do you think, what do you think about that? So. It, it, so if, let's see if I understand your question. You mean like how um, when you have like a, a virtualization, like you have a VM, right? You have your traditional app, and maybe you're thinking about running it in, in a pod, and mm -hmm. you're trying to justify, should I run it in a pod, or should I continue running in a virtual machine? Is that, that's what you're looking for? Uh, so yes, but usually what happens is when people think of VMs, they are bigger than what we should have as a pod, you know? that's. It's, they're not small things, usually, but... I think one of the use cases for, uh, for Kubert in general is, a, is kind of a provide a way for, um, for data center, like a traditional virtualization users to move to microservices and, uh, <clears throat> and get into the world of uh, cloud native. Um, so one of the ways to do it is, uh, is kind of take uh, some of the... Uh, uh, some of the applications that are easily uh, containerized uh, and run them alongside with their monolith VMs, um, so they don't have to. <clears throat> they don't have to. Um, they can migrate into this environment uh, fast, and then and then uh, continue containerizing, but uh, without breaking, uh, you know, without breaking their uh, their production environment or whatever they were doing before. Uh, another way, uh, these VMs don't have to be big. I mean, sometimes you can run uh, um, a very small uh, footprint VMs uh, that emulate, uh, I don't know, an antenna or something like this. So there are uh, multiple use cases. There's also like um, uh, uh, backup and restore that uh, use cases that are, uh, that are out there. So I think there are lots of uh, interesting ideas that VMs are still, uh, VMs are still needed. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Do you mind going to the mic? Just because I think for the recording. Yeah. So one of your gentlemen um, are from Red Hat. Is that correct? Y yes. Uh, 
so the OpenShift uh, virtualization OSV project, um, I believe, uses Qvert heavily under 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 the hood, right? So um, are they also? So I guess two types, two parts to this. Are they big advocates to the feature promotions that we're going to see and the what's next for Qvert? And how is that tied to the project of OSV in the future? And you know how how is that relationship going to work with Qvert's growth alongside um, OSV, which brings Qvert more into the enterprise? And if that makes sense. Um, I'll just say that um, I mean Red Hat traditionally did uh, all the work upstream first, um, so we contribute uh, upstream and we grow the community, and community is important for us. And then, as we, as with all the other products, I mean, we uh, we first develop upstream and then we um, uh, bring it into productization. I, I don't know how to speak about. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to speak about uh, um, the, uh, um, the the Red Hat side of things. I'm here to speak more about uh, the community. But uh, uh, Peter in uh, in the back of the room can can answer questions about. Uh, Open civilization. And what was your second question? I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get that. Hi, I'm Peter Lauterbach. I'm the product manager for OpenShift Virtualization from Red Hat. Um, I think the basic answer, is, your question was, how, what's the relationship between Qvert and OpenShift Virtualization, and how does that impact everything? And I realize I'm at KubeCon, so I'll be, keep this short. Um, basically, as Vladek said, everything we contribute actually goes upstream in Qvert first. So there's actually features upstream that are not quite ready for a product, and they will stay up there until they are. And, and by the way, we're not the only people using Qvert in production products, right? So if you go, and this is where I'll take my red hat hat off, if you go see the folks over at SUSE, right, there's a version of Rancher, I think it's called Harvester, that uses Qvert. Um, the folks at Platform 9 use it, Google uses it. Um, as part of Anthos, did I leave one? I think that's all of them, right? Oh, and NVIDIA uses it in uh, yeah. GeForce Now. <laughs> yeah, there are others like uh, Sivo. And... Yes, yeah, sm and, and actually some smaller service providers uh, use it as well. So we, we are not the only ones, and as Vladek said, the more folks we have join the community, it's actually better for Qvert in general, so please take my red hat hat off, but yes. <laughs> Please help Qvert out as either a contributor or adopter. Yeah. So I have one because this story of you know Qvert containers then going back to VMs, it, it feels like we had a very similar story years ago when OpenStack was emerging. So you know we had physical workload, people were moving to VMs. At the same time, you know, sub product of OpenStack, like for example, Ironic, they were supposed to give people using VMs still access to physical hardware. Now we are going to the next layer. So we are giving people containers, but we are giving them access back to VMs. So probably we all are aware of the fact that people are doing Kubernetes on top of OpenStack, on top of blah, 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 blah. So, you know, you can stack it all together and, and then can we somehow combine it all so that if you have a user who's who was doing OpenStack with Ironic to get physical servers, and now he's doing, on top of this OpenStack, Kubernetes with Qvert because he wants to do VMs, but at the same time, he still wants to do OpenStack Ironic to get you know, one layer below. Can it even work all together so that can you get a coherent ecosystem, you know, physical stuff plus OpenStack or whatever you do, plus Qvert so that you get it all using one platform, or is the philosophy at some point that you are just saying, well, you are doing containers now, you are doing Qvert, you get VMs, but forget about physical because it's, it's, too, it's too much. You know, is there anything considered like this or, or maybe there is no use case or maybe people are 
not not showing this use case. You know, what's what's your view on that? Well, I think there's, um, if I understand correctly, I mean, there there is in the ecosystem like the the middle queue project, like well, the, I might even use ironic, like that um, does bare metal provisioning. Like I, I, like I guess the way I look at it is, like Kubernetes has very defined use cases, and then, like you want you like Kubernetes, you like pods, you like containers, you want to run pods and you want to run containers, you like the APIs, whatever. And then, but you also like virtual machines. It's a realistic thing. Maybe you just want a kernel to sit because you've got in between you and your hardware or because you've got untrusted users. Like there's a lot of good reasons like to, to think about it. And then, and then, then you throw in if, you know, metal cube is bare metal provisioning, the same concept, like you can put it behind Kubernetes APIs. So, I mean, that's, that's what I would say is like, there are projects out there that you know, when you kind of combine these things, I think you can get probably some of what you're looking for, um, you know, taking the, these, these three use cases together. Thank you. You're welcome. So, I think the Open uh, OpenStack uh, Foundation has announced that they will make the control plane more into the, like, Kubernetes way of things. Is there any plan, like, you know, making the compute use cube word instead of still the traditional KVM way? The, um, so Kubernetes really uses KVM. Okay. I mean, we are based on KVM. Um, um, what I uh, meant is like you deploy a w physical machine, then you put containers on top of it in the, com um, like, you know, on the compute node, like in no Nova or libvirt, uh, which still acts like, you know, a separate structure compared to the Kubernetes way. So is there any way we, like, you know, you guys thinking about, like, you know, make it, making it Kubernetes way for the computes? So we don't have a, <clears throat> like a defined interaction with the, with OpenStack. Okay. As part of our, uh, um, I'm not sure what, I mean, what OpenStack does in that regard. What I would say is that <clears throat> I mean, the way Kubert, uh, sorry, the way um, uh, KVM works is that you have the user space part, okay. and you have a, a kernel-based virtual machine implementation in the kernel, and then uh, the user space part is uh, QMU, uh, which emulates the, the virtual machine, and then um, interacts with the with the kernel part. So when we run uh, QMU in a container, mm -hmm. it's still kind of a native a native way, just a way to, to deliver this into uh, the Kubernetes world uh, is, by, is by using containers. So it doesn't really make a difference whether this uh, QMU was running as a user space application uh, based on Nova, okay. <clears throat> or is it now running as a, as a user space application inside the container? It's just like a way of delivering this. Got it. And also, like, do you guys run any databases on top of the any use cases that you we have? have a community users that are running databases on the cube uh, board. On cube, on cube. Okay. Thank you. So, in terms of um, stability and like production readiness, since it's based on like you know Linux KVM technology, do you feel it is as production ready as? if we're using KVM today and we're just wrapping it with Kubernetes, or is there a risk there, right? Because changing essentially your hypervisor layer can be scary for an enterprise that's already running. Um, so I just kind of wanted to hear your comments on that. Sure, yeah, I think, um, well, I think it's an interesting question because um, if you think about technically what Kubert is, like we, we launch a pod, so we've got, a, we've got some, some user namespaces, We've got some processes in that pod. We've got a Livert server, a little helper process that Kubert runs, and then we've got QMU process. Like a lot of what you'll see when you when you interact with Kubert, it's like if you just use Verge on your laptop. Like a lot of the stuff is there, but where you'd have some hard times with, and this is like what we've been talking about, like as as we've grown as a project and as Kubernetes has grown is the features that aren't as cloud native. And like Vladik mentioned, pods being immutable as an assumption in Kubernetes for, for a long time. So like how can you possibly 
change the container spec? How can you eventually edit the domain? Like, you can't do that. So, like, we can't really vertically scale these things. So, eventually, Kubernetes changed. So, my point is, where you're going to run into with this kind of thing is, like, when Kubernetes doesn't natively support a traditional virtualization feature or doesn't have a way to do it, doesn't necessarily need to support it, per se, but, like, has a way for us to implement it, then, then you can run into some challenges. But for the most part, like a large majority of features, like, we're, like what we're alluding to is that very mature features that you're seeing here that are, that are listed. Um, and, and these are kind of things that you see that for, for very mature virtualization platforms. But it's, it's something that, um, that over many years we struggled with to get, and we've gotten to this point. But you know, there, so there might be a few here and there like left that you maybe are accustomed to or expect to work in a certain way that might be a little different in this environment. I would just add that um, Kubernetes is already being used by, by large uh, companies that are running the, running Kubernetes in, in production. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, a, it's a, on one hand, a, a traditional virtualization features that are very stable and very well known. But uh, in addition to this, it opens the door uh, for combining these features together with uh, with the flexibility of, uh, of, of Kubernetes and uh, all the cloud, cloud native uh, stuff that wasn't present in the regular uh, traditional virtualization. So uh, in terms of stability uh, of these features, I think uh, we're in the right place. Yeah, the short answer is it's, it's, it's stable. It's that um, you got you got to commit to the use case. If you really like Kubernetes and you want to run pods and alongside virtual machines, this is, this is exactly what you'd want to do. This is where you'd want to go. There might just be like some interfaces that are not there yet for edge might use be a cases. few. Um, yeah. I can't even, I can't think of some. Yeah, there are obviously but, challenges. I mean, uh, but for the most part, like you see, we're not working. yeah, you'll, you'll see like you, you can run it. Because the thing to think about, like you're not, you're no longer just like, like it's no longer just like Kuver or it's no longer KVM just like owning everything and doing whatever it wants. You know, now it's, we're, we're, we have to, we've got our API in front of that. It's like, it's like we've got Kubernetes and we've got Libvirt. And so we have to deal with the translation. And for the most part, it's really good translation. And over time, it's gotten even better. But in some cases, like there, you, we kind of try and make it work or like for different, different APIs. But the point is like that it is stable and that you'll see a lot, the large majority of uh, the features that you'd run you know, today on, on your hypervisor, you'll see and get with Qvert. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're at time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.